ಅನಾತ್ಮಿ ಪಿಂಡೋ ಯಾಕ್ತ ಹೇತು ಬಲಾನ್ ಮತ ಕರಾಮಲಕವತ್ಸಾಕ್ಷಾತ್ಮನ ಪ್ರತಿಪಾದಯ The disciple said, If by the strength of these arguments the gross body is considered as not self, then please exhaustively explain and directly indicate the self as clearly as a fruit in the hand. Gata drashta ghatat binna sarvata na ghato yata The teacher said, Firmly ascertain in yourself, just as the perceiver of a pot is ever distinctly different from the pot and can never be the pot, so too you, the perceiver of your body, are distinct from your body and can never be the body. Similarly, be sure in yourself that you, the seer of the senses, are not the senses themselves, and ascertain that you are neither the mind nor the intellect nor the prana, vital air. Sanghato pitata naham miti drishya vilakshanam drashta ramanu manena nipunam sangpradharaya Similarly, be sure that you are not the complex of the gross and the subtle bodies, and intelligently determine by inference that you, the seer, are entirely distinct from the seen. Namaste. So, this is the detailed explanation of the first stage of meditation based on Vivekaha, discrimination between the temporary and the eternal. And it works by a process of inference. What is inference? It means this relationship is common and seen everywhere in life and in the world. And this same relationship can be applied over here to something spiritual so that you can directly see the relationship and the difference between these things. So in each of the three verses spoken by the teacher, he does two things. He creates the ground of an inference, and then he makes the inference itself. Let's look at the first verse. The teacher said, Firmly ascertain in yourself, just as the perceiver of a pot is ever distinctly different from the pot and can never be the pot, this is the ground of the inference. If you have a pot, well, I don't have a pot handy. <laughs> If you have a pot, you are not the pot. I think anybody can understand that, right? The pot is different from you. And you never become the pot. Uh, you just perceive it. It's over there. You're the subject. The pot is the object. Similarly, you, the perceiver of your body, are distinct from your body and can never be the body. So this is an inference. The relationship between you and the pot is similar to the relationship between you and your body. You perceive the pot. Therefore, you are different from the pot. And you can never become the pot. The pot is a pot. You are you. 
Similarly, you, the living entity, the spirit, the consciousness, the seer, are different from the body because the body is seen. You are the subject, the body is the object. And you can never become the body just as much as you can never become the pot. This is inference. And so logical influence can be a step to direct perception of the self. And indeed, it is the first step in the process of meditation. Neti neti. I am not this body, I am not this mind, and so on. So let's take a look at the second verse. Similarly, be sure in yourself that you, the seer of the senses, are not the senses themselves, and ascertain that you are neither the mind, nor the intellect, nor the prana, vital air. This is a similar thing. So by inference, we can conclude that the seer is different from the scene and never becomes the scene. So this is the ground of inference that establishes the separation between the body and the self. And now one more example. Similarly, be sure that you are not the complex of the gross and the subtle bodies, and intelligently determine by inference that you, the seer, are entirely distinct from the scene. In general, universally, as a matter of fact, there has to be a difference between the seer and the scene, or seeing would not be possible. That distinction is vivekaha, discrimination. And the same process of discrimination applies to everything seen, including the body, the mind, the senses, the sense objects, the world, etc., etc. Whatever you can see, whatever you can perceive, is not you. It's pretty darn simple. But due to this pernicious habit, this disease of identification, of superimposition, where one superimposes the sense objects on the self and imagines that they have the qualities and functions of the self, like consciousness, will, memory, and so on then we're going to continue to confuse the seer and the seen, the subject and the object, the self and the world. And remember, this is the cause of suffering. It's just like if you have an uncle, let's call him Uncle Joe, and Uncle Joe is a multimillionaire, right? And you're thinking to yourself, oh, Uncle Joe is rich. He's going to leave me all kinds of money when he dies. And so you don't take care of your finances. You just spend everything you get. You live high off the hog or on the hog, whatever. <laughs> live like a hog. <laughs> and don't take any care for the future. And one day, Uncle Joe finally passes away. And guess what? He don't leave you a dime. In the same way, all of the objects of perception in the world, including the body and the mind, the intelligence, everything, one of these days is going to pass away without remainder. It's going to be gone, like I wish this mosquito would be gone. <laughs> it's going to be gone, and it's never going to come back. So... If we identify with these things, then when they disappear, we're going to suffer. Because instead of thinking, well, this is the loss of the body, or this is the loss of my youth, <laughs> or whatever, we're going to think, oh, this is a loss of myself. Well, much more serious matter and creates much more suffering. So the suffering based on the body 
is bad enough. Huh? The body is going to get old, it's going to get various diseases, it's going to lose function, it's going to lose strength, it's going to lose beauty, and so on, and is finally going to dwindle and die. That is inevitable for everyone. Even Silicon Valley billionaires who invest in life extension research, yeah, they may get a few more years out of it, but ultimately, it's going to be over. So what happens then? If we are identified with the body, we're going to suffer more than if we're detached. And to the degree that we are detached from the body, to that degree, the body's suffering cannot affect us. So, if one is completely detached, if one is fully self-realized, fully identified with Brahman, there's no suffering at all. That's the third stage of meditation. We're still on the first stage, <laughs> trying to separate this from that. This generally means the body, the mind, the senses, the perceptions, the memory, and so on, the gross and subtle bodies. And that in the Upanishads generally refers to Brahman, the self, the reality, the permanent, the eternal, the real. So when the illusion passes away, we suffer to the degree that we are identified with it. We suffer to the degree to which we have overlaid or superimposed the external things on our self. Is this clear? I hope so. <laughs> because it's elementary. If we can't separate, or if we can't discriminate between the body and the self, then we cannot get any further in meditation. In the yoga system, this is called pratyahara. Pratyahara means withdrawing the senses from the world and turning the attention inward on the self. So you'll notice if you go hang out in yoga centers and schools, they don't teach pratyahara. They don't teach dharana, dhyana, or what to speak of samadhi. Why? Because yoga has become simply just another exercise form based on the body, based on identification with the body, based on overlaying, superimposing the body on the self, thinking I am the body, the body is me. So yoga is so ironic, has become the absolute opposite of what it's really supposed to be all about. What a tragedy. Huh? What a fraud. It's a confidence game. It's a scam. I say it right out loud. I don't care if it's a multi-billion dollar worldwide business. It's a scam. It's a shill. It's a fraud. It's a deception. Because yoga means linking. Linking the small self the empirical self, with the infinite self, Brahma. This is available, I mean, this knowledge is there in every Vedic scripture. It's also there in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, which they pretend to follow, but they actually don't. At best, they teach a little pranayama. And pranayama, yeah, it'll make you strong, it'll make you healthy, all right. But if you don't have the knowledge, the vidya, that the self is different from the body, you can't go any further than that. That's it. Yeah, you can make your body nice and strong. You can help make your intelligence sharp and all that. But if you don't have the knowledge that the self is different from the body, 
and proceed to investigate it. And as it says in the verse, ascertain for yourself. Look into it for yourself. Don't just take our word for it or even the scripture's word for it. Look into it in yourself, in your own experience. Are you different from the objects that you perceive? Yes. Does that apply to everything, including the body? Yes. Does that even apply to the mind? Yes. Because one is perceiving the thoughts, right? Therefore, they are different from the self. Bas, period, end of story. That's all there is. There ain't no more. So, at least we should get to this point in meditation where we can see directly and ascertain in our own experience and make very clear to our own self on our own terms that we are different from that which we perceive. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.